constant repetition of sometimes simple, other times complex behaviours or actions referred to as stereotypic behaviours or movement stereotypies. But really, this is an indication of madness, of severe neglect, sometimes severe stress, certainly an inability to cope with the environment. Now, why do animals do this? Well, we know that animals are trying to maintain their own level of self-stimulation, their own level of buzz. And they would do this in the wild by mixing with other members of their own species, by hunting, grazing, moving, sheltering, and playing. And many, many times in zoological gardens, there are no opportunities to perform these natural behaviours, so they invent their own compulsive, abnormal behaviours. This is a prime example of stereotypic behavior. The animal simply repeats the same action over and over again. Perhaps pacing, perhaps head bobbing, perhaps just rolling their heads and moving from foot to foot and stopping only to sleep and feed writes zoologist Colin Tudge in his recently published book, Last Animals at the Zoo. Who knows what an animal living permanently in a prison, without purpose, in enforced idleness, deprived of family and friends, denied the plains, trees, riverbanks, in fact, the whole ecosystem in which it has evolved over thousands of years, what this animal will require to remain sane. Animal madness has been described in the literature from three, four hundred years ago. Certainly Charles Darwin did. A prominent zoologist, Heidegger, in the 1950s, produced a very detailed account of abnormal compulsive behaviours in zoo species. Yet nothing has been done about it. Forty years later, zoos are still keeping animals under essentially similar circumstances, and the animals are just as disturbed.
Dr. Shizuki Sato of Miyazaki University observed 116 giraffes living in 31 zoological parks in Japan. They showed not only tongue pain, but also other abnormal behaviors. Zoo directors have assumed that making an animal's cage look more natural causes the occupant to become less agitated, less frustrated, less stressed, less mad. But what are the children? What do they need to know? Well, as always, they need to know the truth. They need to know that these animals are suffering, that they're sick, and that they're not to be objects of fun, which is so often how they're presented in zoo. The laughter that they're directing at these animals could as well be directed at disturbed people living in the psychiatric ward or prisoners who've been exposed to very many days and weeks and years of solitary confinement or torture. In the 18th century, the famous mental institution, Bedlam, welcomed Londoners, charging them a few pennies for a day's amusement watching the inmates. Robert Reed, in his book, Bedlam, Harvard University Press, 1952, states, this famous mental institution played exactly the same role in London life as our zoo does today. Uh, uh, zoo directors have been slow to react to the psychological needs of captive wildlife. The public has been kept ignorant, understandably perhaps. Well, who's going to advertise that his zoo is exhibiting mentally disturbed wildlife for our entertainment and pleasure?